Thank you, John, for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be with you all virtually. Uh, although I know we would all love to be together in person, it's still a real treat to collaborate and co-learn with like-minded people. Um, and starting now, we are going to think together about soul training and what it means to pursue character development and spiritual formation as Christ followers and sports people. So the beautiful photo that you are looking at now is the Van Andel Soccer Stadium in Holland, Michigan at Hope College. As John mentioned, I played soccer here and I spent a lot of hours on this field. I shed a lot of blood, sweat and tears on this field and in particular spent a lot of time here training for our fitness test. You know, soccer requires a lot of running, a lot of cardiovascular fitness. We had multiple fitness tests, but one of them was called 120s, where we had to run the length of the field, which is 120 yards, hence the name. And then we had to do that in 22 seconds or less. And then we had to make it back the 120 yards in 48 seconds or less. And we had to do that 10 consecutive times. Now, it's not the most intense thing. It's not impossible, but it does require some training. And so the way that my teammates and I would train is we wanted to over-prepare and we trained a lot of different ways. Sometimes we'd try to make it down in 18 seconds. Sometimes we'd cut our rest in half. Sometimes we'd do it on the beach. Sometimes we'd do it in more reps than the required 10. We'd do 12 or 15 or 20 even. And we wanted to be over-prepared come preseason in August. And I give you this illustration about 120s because I want to introduce us to the principle of indirect training. And this happens when a person trains indirectly for what she cannot train for directly. She prepares what she can for what may or will happen. And we train like this in our sports. I want to pose the question of why wouldn't we do this in our spiritual walks so that we are better able to follow Christ and prepared in the face of hardships. We train in our sports, we can train in our spiritual journeys as well. So what good would that do? What's the point? What's the purpose? I'll give you two. The first is we train our souls to experience God's loving goodness by spending time with him and paying attention to his beauty and glory everywhere. This is what I refer to as the life abundant, which I draw from John 10, 10, when Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And then secondly, you train your soul to prepare for the inevitable trials and hardships, the quote unquote wildernesses of life. And this wilderness prep I get from the first part of Luke chapter four, when the Holy Spirit leads Jesus into the desert wilderness adjacent to the Jordan. And he spends 40 days before his public ministry training his soul in disciplines like prayer, fasting, solitude, silence, stillness, scripture. And Jesus, for the rest of this talk, he is going to be our model and the goal of our soul training. Another way to think about soul training would be the why, the what, and the how. So why we train our souls is for awareness of, proximity to, and intimacy with God. And then what we do to achieve that why is apprenticeship, discipleship, therefore following, and therefore by spending time and following, we become more like Christ and achieve Christ likeness. And how we do that what, how we are disciples, is through intentional practices of spiritual disciplines. This is a helpful model for thinking about how people grow. Again, I draw this from Dallas Willard, who if you're not familiar, Christian professor of philosophy at the University of Southern California, who was known for equipping Christ followers and pastors to live a with God life now. Now look at this triangle, and you see that Jesus is in the middle. That's because, again, he is our, both our model and our goal. Then you have these three other corners of the triangle, the Holy Spirit, our experiences, and spiritual disciplines. We cannot grow without the Holy Spirit. We just can't. The Holy Spirit is our guide, our counselor. He convicts us, offers discernment, and he intercedes for us. Then our life experiences also help us grow. And most of what I'm talking about is our trials, the suffering and the pain that grows us, as well as our community, the people who are investing us, both our successes and our failures, and counsel from the wise. And then we can engage in healthy habits that help us grow, spiritual disciplines. Spiritual disciplines are repeated practices of the mind, body, and heart, and spirit, 
that rely on God, cooperate with the Holy Spirit, and are directed by Christ for the purpose of paying attention to the presence of God and therefore becoming more like Jesus. So these spiritual disciplines, they're not earning a person anything, rather they're aligning the mind, body, heart, and spirit with God for the purpose of growth. Now I'll note that Christ likeness is actually just a byproduct of spending time with Jesus, which is what spiritual disciplines are. Think about it this way. Why did Jesus practice spiritual disciplines? Was it to become more like Christ? To become more like himself? Or was it to spend time with his father? Or was it in preparation for a call that would inevitably involve unbelievable suffering? So this is the point in this presentation where I feel like I have to talk about grace and kind of offer a qualifier of grace because a lot of Protestants start to get uncomfortable. They don't want to be legalistic. They don't want to engage in workspace salvation. But I have to say, spiritual disciplines are not a means to salvation. Rather, they are a means to experiencing God. They're not salvific. They can't save you. Rather, they're a way to grow closer to God. They're not formulaic but they're a way to encounter the presence of God. They cannot save, but they can strengthen. Dallas Willard said it this way. He said, grace is not opposed to effort. Grace is opposed to earning. And so we're saved by grace. We're not paralyzed by it. Grace doesn't mean that we can't or shouldn't do anything to live into the reality of our savedness. Disciplines only become legalism when they are divorced from right relationship with Christ. Because the ability to be a disciple, to be an apprentice of Christ, is soaked in grace. Because grace initiates, sustains, enables, and empowers disciples. Dallas Willard said it this way, the true saint burns grace like a 747 jet burns fuel on takeoff. And I do think it's, that sums that up pretty well. And so we cannot be afraid to engage in spiritual disciplines or efforts of growth. We spent hours upon hours each week investing in the educational and athletic development of people. We train our minds through education, school, homework, personal study, things like puzzles and reading and writing and lectures and talks and forms like the one you're at right now, doing research, using logic. We train our bodies. We do that through our physical fitness, through our strength training and weight training, through agility, through putting the right things in our body, through flexibility and mobility, through sleeping enough, through developing skills and competencies in sports, through modern medicine, drinking enough water, and having the right body composition and body type for the sport that we're competing in. We invest a lot. So why shouldn't we train our hearts? Why shouldn't we train our souls? Is it just a couple hours in church each week? Is that all there is to this whole following Jesus gig? Now, I want to note right here that the heart does not equal the soul, but the heart is the gatekeeper of the soul because the heart houses our love and therefore our worship, which is what the soul was made to do. So strengthen the heart and you strengthen your soul. And we need to train our souls because when we train our souls, that gives meaning and purpose and worship to our thoughts and behaviors of our minds, hearts, and bodies. So it's not just a couple hours in church each week or the explicitly spiritual practices that make up our following of Jesus. It's everything that we do. And we train our souls through intentional thoughts, emotions, and behaviors in our minds, hearts, and bodies. It's not just a couple hours in church or explicitly spiritual practices that form us. It's everything that we do with a certain heart posture. Frank said this last night, that there's no sacred secular divide. Everything that we do can be worshiped with the right heart posture. Humans are more than just thinkers and doers. We're also spiritual. And so in addition to training our minds and our bodies, we need to train our souls through intentional mental, physical, and heart practices, our daily activities, as well as spiritual disciplines congruent with the historic Christian faith, just like prayer, meditation, solitude, silence, fasting, stillness, celebration, gratitude, and confession, and service. And so training the soul through disciplines means intentionally choosing practices that first help us pay attention to God 
and second, prepare us for inevitable challenges in life, in turn growing us closer to Christ, which in turn makes us more like Christ. And so I think that there are some misconceptions that I want to debunk before I continue that maybe sports people struggle with. And first, that would be it's shame inducing when you miss a day or you fail. Yesterday, Avery did a great job talking about a lot of the messages athletes tell themselves. And one of them is like, be good or don't even show up. Like you have to be tough. You have to be good. You have to be competent. You have to be responsible. So if you fail or you miss a day, you are bad. You should feel shame. Or secondly, again, that it's workspace salvation. It is earning merit such a giant spiritual scoreboard. And I'm competing with others and I'm proving that I'm good. But these aren't helpful ways to think about disciplines. Instead, the truth about spiritual disciplines is that they're an invitation to an abundant life of spending time with Christ. Again, this is the John 10, 10. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And so disciplines teach us to give our attention to God. They deepen and grow our capacity to love and enjoy God. One way that I think is helpful to think about this is spiritual disciplines are a lot like watching a sunrise. You don't practice spiritual disciplines to get the sun to come up in the morning because the sun's going to rise no matter what you do. But you practice disciplines in order to get yourself to wake up in the morning so that you can witness and behold the beauty of the sunrise. God is and will work. And he's present no matter what we do. Disciplines are just putting ourselves in a position and an attitude to witness and experience them. And also in this abundant life, Disciplines are not just a performance enhancer, but a performance eternalizer. And this is what I mean by that. I think discipline is contagious within ourselves. I think discipline spills over from one area of our life to the other. So if I'm a disciplined athlete, I'm going to want to be a better student and friend. If I'm a good spouse at home, I'm going to want to be the best coworker I can be. And so again, this isn't why we pursue discipline to enhance our performance, but it is a byproduct. But what's more is it eternalizes what you're doing in a way. And I'm not saying that we're like writing your name in the book of life or building you a monument of glory or something. I'm saying that when you practice the spiritual discipline to pay attention of God, you are worshiping the eternal God. When you do a behavior from the root of faith, hope, and love, those remain. And you are engaging, engaging in an activity where you're focusing on the eternal God. And so secondly, spiritual disciplines prepare us for the wilderness. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I have found in my life that I usually know what the right thing to do is, but I'm not always great at actually doing it. So for example, my significant other might say or do something. And in that moment, I know that the right thing to do is to pause take a deep breath and pray and ask for patience and ask for grace and then respond slowly and lovingly. But I don't always do that. And so if we want to be Christ followers, apprentices of Christ, that means that in that moment, I want to respond like Jesus would respond. But here's the thing. I can't do in a moment's instant what Jesus would do if I hadn't prepared or trained the way, the way that he had prepared. Let me explain this with sports because I think that training makes sense to us in sports because a basketball player that only spends five hours in the gym every week can't realistically expect to perform in the same way that MJ or insert whichever gym rat you like would have performed. Or a person who never even wears ice skates, never practices dribbling the puck, never works on a slap shot, can't expect to score a goal in the third period like Wayne Gretzky repeatedly did. And if a soccer player never trains shots from distance, she's definitely not going to expect to score a goal from half field like Carly Lloyd did in the 2015 World Cup. We know that we can't perform like these great athletes in, in the moment that we want without having trained the way that, the, that they trained. And so if we want to be followers of Christ and be like him, it's not enough to just really try in that moment of temptation or difficulty to behave like he would have behaved. And so this is where I usually crush some Sunday school childhood memories. WWJD, what would Jesus do? 
isn't a helpful way to think about spiritual formation or Christian living. Rather, we want to train like Jesus trained. And we want to pay attention to his life and what he did. And we want to spend our lives with him, learning from him and spending that time with him. And so we train like Jesus trained in order to prepare us for wilderness. So the photo that you guys are looking at right now is one of my own personal wildernesses. This is the Hope College athletic training room. And I spent a lot of time here in college because I got a lot of injuries. Now I told you that I loved my Hope experience and that's true, but I definitely try not to look in the past with rose colored lenses because it was difficult through these injuries. Now I'm grateful for them because I grew and I learned a lot, but it was difficult. Through those injuries, I learned that wilderness suffering is inevitable and yet it grows you and yet we never really seek it. This dawned on me my senior year of college. Um, I just blew my knee out and ended my collegiate career and I was doing rehab with my athletic trainer who for the record is amazing and was amazing and put me back together mind, body and spirit and she shared this prayer with me that went something along the lines of be grateful for trials because they grow you. And that's biblical and that's true. But then I started wondering, gee, if suffering is so beneficial, why don't we willingly seek it out? Everyone says it's so valuable while you're in it and yet no one ever pursues it. And this is where the principle of indirect training comes back into play. Now, I, I want to note really fast that there is tragedy in life that is beyond preparedness. There are some things that people endure that are so horrible and sad that there's no way to prepare. But for the general wildernesses of life that either make you bitter or make you better, how you respond has everything to do with how you prepared. And so spiritual disciplines become a way of indirectly training for these wildernesses. Because the reality is that life's messy, unpredictable, sometimes really cruel, often out of our control. And yet we can always control two things. We can control our attitude and we can control our effort. Ask any coach, he or she is gonna tell you that there's a lot of things out of your control as a coach. I heard it described by um, national champion coach and she said that coaching is a lot like sending interns in to close the deal that the CEO prepared but coaches and Christians can always control how you prepare and so this is what I wonder when the devil came to tempt Jesus in the desert one that looked a lot like the picture you see on the screen I bet that the devil thought he was going after Jesus when Jesus was at his weakest. But if I had to bet, I think that the devil was actually stepping into the ring when Jesus was at his strongest because he had just spent 40 days training his soul. And so you do not train your soul to prove that you are worthy of love and earn love, to prove that you are better than others, to pay a debt to make sure you end up morally in the black or to get things from God as if you were a lucky rabbit foot. Rather, you train your soul to turn your gaze towards God, to see that he has been gazing lovingly at you the whole time, and to prepare indirectly for life's inevitable wildernesses. And so this is my last slide. And the last thing I'm gonna to touch on for Q&A is what difference do the disciplines make in actual competition? Like, what is this actually gonna look like? So here are just a few short examples. Scripture, why does scripture matter? Well, if I'm standing hip to hip with my defensive assignment at tip off and I'm really afraid of messing up and that what my coach is gonna think and what all the fans are gonna think if I don't defend well, if I can recall in that moment the word of God, I can tap into the power of God. If I can recall, have I not commanded you, do not be afraid for I'm with you, or I've not given you a spirit of fear, timidity, but of power, love, and self-control, that not only calms me, but I am inviting God in and relying on him. Furthermore, 
wholesome language, you guys. My uh, high school basketball coach used to have this funny little saying where he'd say, if you pour a glass with milk and then you bump it and spill it, water's not going to come out. And that was his way of saying what you put in is what you get out. And so what language is going to come out of you when you get quote unquote bumped? Prayer. When you pray, you are yoking yourself to the object of your prayer. This really matters for those not so easy to love teammates. Identity. Why does it matter that we meditate on who we are? Well, when I get chewed out by a teammate or called out by a coach in film or find that I was gossiped about by my coworkers, can I return to who God says, says that I am, that I'm not what I have or what I do or what other people say about me? How quickly can I bounce back? And finally, if you practice intentional gratitude, you're going to wind up being thankful for everything. Bus drivers, gear, food, the opportunity to even practice. And so these are just a very small handful of many ways that we can intentionally train our souls. And we intentionally engage in this soul training in order to, one, better pay attention to God, and to, two, indirectly prepare for the wildernesses of life. So now we can... Uh, continue to think together about how this looks through a Q&A. Thanks, Elizabeth. That was, that was great and very informative uh, and life-changing for all of us if we do this. I wish I would have known this when I was in college playing. Um, first question, uh, you talked a bit about apprenticeship. Can you explain more about what you mean by this? Yeah. So apprenticeship, I don't think we get it as much nowadays because now we do internships and go to college as opposed to pursuing apprenticeships. But what an apprentice was back in the day was if I knew I wanted to be a carpenter, I would literally just find one that was good and follow him around all day and watch him and learn from him and spend time with him. And that was how I became like him. And so if we want to be apprentices of Christ, we do want to follow him in our whole lives and spend time with him and look at what he's doing and think about why he's doing it and model it after him. So honestly, I just think apprenticeship is another word for discipleship or Christian or Christ follower. Mm, thanks. That's really helpful because sometimes we focus so much on knowledge, but not experiential learning. Mm -hmm. um, so that's great. So the disciplines then strengthen our ability to follow Jesus. Correct. I would say they strengthen our ability to follow Jesus, but mostly, again, that's almost a byproduct. Like first and foremost, we engage in practices where I'm, we engage in practices where the main point is turning my mind and my heart and my whole attention, and sometimes my body, depending on what the discipline is, it's focusing on God. Like simply the first thing that a spiritual discipline is, is really paying attention to God. And after that, that's like when all this magic happens, where I am learning and I am, I feel loved and I have more love to give. And I realize that because I'm spending time with him as an apprentice, I'm becoming more like him. That's great. A question. So we talked about the spiritual disciplines. We talked about athletic disciplines. One person asks here, can you think of any imaginative practices that actually integrate the two while you're competing? Yeah that would integrate a sports practice and a spiritual practice. Yes. So Mike Austin had a really great article he published where he basically pointed out there are spiritual disciplines that all people do, like that all Christ followers that aren't even sporty can do like prayer and service and confession. And then there are ways that sports themselves can be disciplines. Like I'm going to go for this run, even though I don't want to, or I'm going to do these disciplines or I'm going to do these pushups as a way to be disciplined. And, and there's this really third unique category of disciplines that are unique to sports, which is, I, which I think is what your question is getting at. I could definitely list a few. Um, the, the first that I would say is a practice of inviting God in 
to the training and competition. Um, this is something that we even instruct at our Faith and Sport Institute retreat that we do with, with our high school youth. But the mere practice of acknowledging the presence of God before and during competition intentionally invites God into that. And you are sanctifying, which is a big seminary word for making holy the place. Another that I would, that I would touch on that I think is, is really important is coming up with some sort of mistake ritual. So Julie Foudy, who um, gold medalist in World Cup championship for the U.S. women's national soccer team, she um, had this mistake ritual where when she messed up in a game, she was wearing a hair tie on her wrist and she would snap it. And she would say to herself, snap out of it. And that was her way of correcting any mental sliding that was going on. So I think as Christians, we have opportunities to reset during our competition in a way that returns our mind and heart to back to God. Um, I used to, I do some like individual soccer lessons and I had, I was coaching this fourth grader and every time she would do any small mistake, she would go, sorry. And I ended up starting to make her like run a lap every time. Cause I was like, you got to stop apologizing. You got to think about your body language. You got to tell yourself positive messages. And so I started to tell her every time you make a mistake, instead of saying, I'm sorry. And focusing on your body language instead say, she would started to say, I can do this. <laughs> so every time she'd make any mistake, she'd go, I can do this. And it actually, it made a difference in her body language too. And so I think, as Christians, we have this opportunity to rely on the word of God when we're playing. Um, and we can return to that, not just as a mistake ritual, but during the downtime of our competition. I could probably go on and on, but we can move on to another question. No, I love it. And I've heard you say before, and I've, and professional coaches do this, um, even practices of how many affirmations you can give verbally or physically high fives. And it's research that shows the more you do that, the happier the players are, the more they get along. And so they actually count how many. Yeah, so there was basically one, there was this one GA, this random GA who basically was just told, you need to just watch Steve Nash for the entire season. So Steve Nash, NBA point guard for the Phoenix Suns, he said, watch Steve Nash, and all you have to do is just count how many high fives that he gives. Because the studies were showing that teams that touch each other were more likely to win. And so what even does that just simple act of high fiving do? And Steve Nash on average high fived, I wanna just say 239 times a game, something along those lines, which, which is a high number. But if you, that's just one example of intentionally building a habit that is both physical and tied emotionally that can have a positive impact for you as an individual and as a team. Oh, that's really good. And one follow-up question, and then John has another one. Um, you mentioned emotions. And some folks just say, well, that's just how I am. You know, I just get angry or I beat myself up. So based on Luke 4 and your experience, how do you really pull down the word of God with the emotion that really wouldn't be is like we don't want to judge emotion it's just an indicator that something's not quite right with our thinking and feeling exactly so emotions are basically like the non-physical state of the soul that is still housed and stored in the body there's actually there are more neurons in the heart than any other part of the body and so we have these spiritual emotional emotions that are physiologically manifested and what those actually are emotions are just roadmaps for ourselves emotions are roadmaps and clues and evidence about how we're doing and how we're relating to, to to the world so this is this is the key though emotions tell us how we are doing but emotions should never ever ever tell us what we should be doing so emotions might be like, I might really be feeling something, but that doesn't necessarily mean that what I am feeling is Christ-like. So, okay, example, I look myself, wow, I am really angry right now. 
but that doesn't necessarily mean that I should be angry. Now, is this, is this a moment of real injustice, a real example of righteousness getting trampled underfoot? Then yeah, that, call, that calls for anger. But okay, that person cut me off in traffic because for whatever reason, like, wow, do I need to be that angry right now? Like maybe that's a small example of injustice, but I don't really need to be, or okay, like, my significant other, I keep picking on him, but let's say he, he like spills something. I don't need or should be angry about that, even if I do. And so Dallas Willard says this in The Renovation of the Heart, and I stand by this. I think this is really, really helpful that feelings are good servants, but terrible masters. And so it's important to distinguish what we're feeling and how we're feeling but that doesn't necessarily need to determine our actions. Yeah, Jackson says he never spills. That's not true. I've seen him spill. But anyway, <laughs> emotions are roadmaps for us, and we can even train our emotions through disciplines. Oh, that's great. A, f a few more questions. Let's see, we've got about four or five minutes. Elizabeth, you referenced uh, Dallas Willard quite a few times, and it's obvious uh, that his work um, has influenced you. Uh, which of his books, if you want to pick one, uh, would you uh, recommend to our attendees and, and why? Yeah. It's a really tough question for me. I would say if you want to think about disciplines, read his book, The Spirit of the Disciplines. But if you want to get a better understanding of Dallas Willard's worldview and what it means to live life eternal in the kingdom of God now, I would recommend The Divine Conspiracy. And so that book is kind of considered the crown of Dallas Willard's literary works. And he basically explains that because Jesus has come, lived, died, and been resurrected. He has ushered in the kingdom of God. And now we, if we want to follow him, are invited in to this kingdom. And we get to participate in this divine conspiracy to undermine the structures of evil that are in place by the way that we live. And so I think it's really phenomenal. He, he knows his Bible, but not only does he know his Bible, he like loves the Bible and loves God so much. And you can really feel that in the way that he teaches. That's great. So a follow-up question as far as um, um, just that kingdom mentality. Uh, Henry Nowen talks about identity lies. Um, and one of the lies that I think athletes, uh, anybody can uh, fall prey to or just be co-opted by is that I am what others say about me. So take a spiritual discipline and walk us through how would that discipline actually counter uh, that lie and then have us internalize God's truth? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really good. So if you want to read more about that thought from Henry Nouwen, read The Prodigal Son, um, Henry Nouwen's book, The Prodigal Son. I'm sure that'll get put in the chat box. But basically, Henry Nouwen explains this, the parable of the prodigal son with the younger son, the older son, and the father, and moves us through this process of, you might be the younger son, you might be looking for your fulfillment through freedom, you might be the older son, you might be looking for fulfillment through affirmation, but we are all called to become fathers to others, and that, pra that requires the discipline of staying home. Because if you think about both of those sons um, in that parable in Luke, both of them leave home. The younger son leaves first. The older son leaves once his younger son's getting this party. And so Henry now encourages us to practice the discipline of staying home. And how do we practice the discipline of staying home? By knowing that we are beloved son or daughter, no matter what. By knowing that we're not what we do or what we have or what other people say about us, like you alluded to. That's tough. And I got to say, I don't think that there's just one thing that you do. I think that it's a daily intentional practice. But one, the, but one discipline that I, that I kind of mentioned um, in my last slide that I encourage think, people to think about is 
return to your return daily to what is true about you. So spend time in scripture, listening to what God says is about you. For example, Psalm 139 tells us that we are knitted together in our mother's womb and there's nowhere that we can go from God, but yet we are masterpieces to him. And so in that, we learn that while we are fully known, whether we like that or not, and despite that, we are fully loved. So by spending time in that scripture, I'm taking away that's true about me that I'm fully known and, and despite that I'm fully loved. And that identity truth is, is beautiful and that's helpful. Um, I will add, again, the, what, the, one of the reasons why that Luke 4 passage of Jesus' temptations in the desert is so, is so useful and helpful when thinking about this is so a lot of New Testament scholars have pointed out that the devil does in try to tempt Jesus with those three different identity lies. Turn that stone into bread. Well, no, I'm not just what I do. Well, um, if you worship me, I'll give you all this stuff. I'll give you all these kingdoms. Well, Jesus knows he's not what he has. Well, throw yourself off this high point and then because angels are going to save you, right? Well, no, I'm not just what other people think about me, whether it's these angels, and I know that I am loved by my father. So I would encourage athletes and sports people and really all people to think about what is the identity lie that you struggle with, and then in return, what is true about you based in scripture. That's great. There's so much more to this, and we encourage uh, our attendees here to uh, check us out and learn more. The last question, and Eric, I'm so glad that you mentioned this. Um, in an age of instant gratification and technology addiction, what ways have you found most effective to encourage athletes to actually create the space to listen in a world of noise? And you just mentioned it, but especially elite athletic departments require so much, but our mental health and soul health need space, safe space. So um, you might even just reference the retreat and how successful it was that nobody took out their phones because yeah. they had something better to do. Yeah, I'll give like just a handful of examples that I have just seen even. So in our um, summer retreat, we don't mandate it, but we ask our high school students to be adults and to not use their tech, their cell phones or whatever devices during um, our different talks and activities. And the first year we did that, we were a little bit like, well, we don't know how this is going to go. Like they might not listen to us, but we were really, really pleased um, with how we were able to just kind of appeal to their better nature and appeal to their own desire to grow and how that worked in setting that tech aside. I'll also just add fasting is um, a discipline that I basically never recommend for athletes with food. I just don't, but you know, you're not a competing athlete. You can think more about that, but fasting does not just have to be a, a food thing. I think tech fasts can be really, really helpful. And I've actually heard about a lot of coaches on the circuit where they do unplugged stuff. Like they'll do every now and again, an unplugged bus ride and when every player gets on the bus, She'll like set her phone in a basket or unplugged team dinners, that kind of thing. Um, I just think it's so important to be in control of your tech, not let your tech control you. John Mark Comer is a pastor and author um, from the Northwest, and he, he calls it parenting your phone. And he's really conservative with his practice. And he and his wife, like they like power off their phones at like 7 PM and then like put them in a closet and then like, don't get them, like don't get them up the next day until like nine or something. So I think we can be better about that as a way not to be distracted and as a way to carve out silence so that we can better listen to God. 